Well, the next act you're going to see is something very special to us. We, the magicians that are in this room, know about the man that this act depicts, a gentleman named Jack Gwynn, who was one of the greatest magicians of the early part of this century. He set a new style, a new tone for magic in the vaudeville era of show business. The gentleman who's going to perform this act is a historian as well as a marvelous performer. And what you're going to see is not just simply a recreation of the act of Jack Gwynn. It is the act that Jack Gwynn does, did. Same costumes, same props, the same music. The only difference is the man in the costume. And the man that's going to do it is great. Please welcome to the stage, David Charvet. <laughs> few minutes we're going to take you back to the, as Larry said, the days of vaudeville. Back to see some magic is presented by a man named Jack Gwynn. Now he was not known to many of you who are not magicians, but during the first half of the century he's one of the top conjurers in our craft and it's a real pleasure to be able to recreate some of his favorite mysteries that have not been seen in many, many years. First of all though, many of you are wondering, what is that guy wearing? <laughs> well, in fact, these are the robes of a Chinese wizard. It's actually a rope that's about 100 years old and comes from the last of the great Chinese dynasties, the Manchu. Now, it's called a dragon robe. And other than the obvious fact of what you see here, there is another reason why the robe receives its interesting name. And I'll tell you all about it. You see, it happened about eight years ago during some archaeological digs near the Forbidden City in Peking, where they excavated the tomb of a Chinese magician, inside of which they found the wizard swathed in drapery, much like this. However, upon further examination, they found that magician was only about four and a half feet tall, which led them to their conclusion as to why the robe had received its interesting name. You see, they deduced that when that magician walked down the great marble halls of the Imperial Palace in the Forbidden City of Peking over 2,000 years ago, because he was only about four and a half feet tall, his robe must have been a dragon on the floor. <laughs> yes, Bill died, and they buried it at the Seaward. Yes, they took care of the robe. Get back to the restaurant when we get back to Miami, okay? <laughs> Jokes are bad, but the kid's a snappy dresser. Okay. All right. All together. No, no. <laughs> we know many of you are celebrating birthdays, weddings, anniversaries, divorces, other happy events. Away. Anyone celebrating a special event this week? Yes. Good. Well, so what we're going to do tonight, because you are celebrating, I can make you all a cake. Would you like that? Yes. yes. Good. As 
that the three you had for dessert last night were not enough. <laughs> I know you. You're the people that have three steak and lobsters, ordered two desserts, then you have the nerve to have sweet and low in your coffee, right? <laughs> Do we have a cake pan backstage, please? That's the cake pan. Call for Philip Morris. <laughs> that dates the act, I'll tell you. A cake pan. A large economy sized cake pan to make large economy sized cakes. A little cake mix. <laughs> it's Ronson all I know. Doesn't make good cakes, but it doesn't make hot cakes. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. <laughs> All right. Michel Flambe, the assistant, <laughs> and the pan. Something like that. There it goes. Think it's cooked long enough, dear? I think so, too. We'll shake it up. When I remove the lid, inside will be a gigantic cake. We will pass it out to everyone in the audience. Are you ready? Here we are. Michael, what's this? Oh. Chicken pot pie. <laughs> Elmer, what are you doing here? Well, which one of you were celebrating a special event out here, birthday, wedding, anniversary? <laughs> right there? Guess what? You get to take Elmer home with you. As you didn't think you'd see Elmer here, but here he is. Elmer, time for you to, as we say in the business, go south for the winter. We're going to wrap him up for you right over here, and we're going to put him in the box and send him to airmail, all right? Elmer, in the box. There he goes. Take your tail with you. Gentlemen, a little Elmer music, please. Okay, there we go. It has nothing to do with the trick, but the union regulations say we have to use it. There we go. Watch him go. extensive travels to India during his career. Matter of fact, he was there for the USO for about 11 months during the days of WW2. And when he was there, he saw a great mystery. I'd like to present it for you this evening. It's one in which a magician hypnotizes a young lady, places her body upon a couch, causes it to rise, float, and remain suspended in midair with no visible means of support. That's what I'd like to do. That's not what I'm going to do. No, no, no. Instead, I'd like to recreate it for you on a little bit smaller scale, using instead of a couch, my wallet is empty, not an uncommon state for most magicians, <laughs> and for that reason, as the old Hindu magicians used to cover the couch with an ornamental cloth, she'd like to borrow a dollar bill from someone in the eyes. Perhaps you, sir, right here, you're close, do you have a dollar bill? If you did not believe it in Jamaica for today, a dollar bill it is. I shall return it to you in the same condition which was received, which is rather tatty at that. <laughs> All right, but now we shall show you the feet of a Hindu magician in a little bit different way because I don't use one hypnotic subject, we use two hypnotic subjects, both of whom I found sitting around at the bar. <laughs>
I figure out how we're done. Well, perhaps you'd like to have a little closer look. Lights. All right, give me a little bit closer look. Watch carefully. Follow me with the lights. seen in about 25 years, so if you have your cameras out, get them ready. Something done with a magic carpet. Watch it. I used to do that act. <laughs> 